All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for another episode of Jackman Radio. I'm your host, Mike Jackman, and I'm very pleased today to be joined by a documentary filmmaker and the director of the superb documentary, uh, Mrs. Payne and the Assassination, Mr. Max Good. Max, how are you today, sir? Doing great. Uh, thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm here in Washington, D.C. Just got in today from Dallas. Uh, I was in Dallas for the uh, one of the JFK assassination conferences, and uh, we showed the movie, and we have another screening tomorrow night in D.C. on uh, the 59th anniversary of the JFK assassination. Oh, that's awesome. How was the response down in Dallas? Or was it in Dallas, the Texas, Texas yeah. event you were at? Yeah, it was in Dallas. It was great. Um, you know, pretty, pretty good showing and, uh, people were really excited about the film. I sold a bunch of DVDs, which I wasn't expecting. I didn't, didn't know people watch DVDs anymore, but, uh, I got some made just in case. Uh, and yeah, a lot of good questions. I mean, this film is, it's unique because it, it really takes on a little, little niche of the JFK assassination story and goes in in depth and so i'm i'm glad that that people are so excited about it and um you know it's it's uh hopefully going to have some crossover appeal to uh people who might just be interested in in true crime documentaries or you know st stuff like that mystery stories and uh yeah i i, I hope uh hope it gets out there wider than than uh you know, the conspiracy, hidden history, research community, you know. I feel you. Yeah, because I, I, we were saying before we went live, I could tell you put just years of work into this. And um, it's it's a real impressive film. And before we get into Ruth Payne, um, just a little bit uh, kind of on your background, you were you were getting your master's or this was your doctorate project. Correct me if I'm wrong. Or how did this kind of evolve into the film that it is? Yeah, I was getting my uh mfa in documentary film uh that was back in 2014 2015 and this was my thesis project i i made a 20 minute film about ruth Payne back then and it was you know it was so dense and the story was so complex i just i knew it deserved to be a full length uh, feature doc. So I uh, pretty much planned on continuing to work on it, doing more interviews and um, expanding it uh, over the next few years. I, I didn't know it was going to take, you know, six, <laughs> seven more years or whatever, but uh, that's that's what it what it took. And uh, I'm, I'm just glad it's, it's done now and people are seeing it and enjoying it. Yeah, that's great. I mean, you're, you know, really sticking with it like that. Um, there's another documentary, I think, I don't think it's been released, but it's supposed to be called The Parkland Doctors. I don't know if you're familiar with that project. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that's ever seen the light of day, as far as I know. From what I've heard, that that project might have been killed on purpose, sort of like a catch and kill really? kind of a situation. That's, that's what somebody told me. Uh, but yeah they they had you know they had a big campaign i think they raised a, a good amount of money they had all the, all these you know doctors who were involved and you know there were uh you know they had some impressive footage that i i saw it was online on i think they had a crowdfunding campaign or something and then it's it just kind of disappeared it's it's never come out oh that's too bad i hope we see something someday but um, you know, I had Joseph McBride on a couple weeks ago and we talked about his research into J.D. Tippett and he was he was singing your praises. And something that was told to him by a first generation JFK researcher was find one specific thing or kind of a tertiary thing within the assassination and focus on that, um, <clears throat> on something that doesn't get talked about a lot and make that your focus. And of course, he spent 30, you know, 35 years, you know, do, researching what happened to J.D. Tippett and that angle. Um, your your angle is Ruth Payne, um, and I really do think that Ruth Payne is one of the most important and underreported aspects of the assassination and connections. Um, you know, simply for the fact that she testi testified perhaps the most to the Warren Commission 
and they relied a lot on her for a, a lot of uh, information pertaining to Oswald. And she's still alive. Uh, you were telling me, I think she just turned 90 and she's still around, still very sharp. And as your film shows, um, even though I think you probably started filming her when she was 84, or 85 or something like that, she's, her memory is amazing and she's very sharp. Um, can you just tell our viewers, and maybe some people who aren't as familiar with who Ruth Payne is and why she might be important, a little bit about her and, and kind of some of her background and, and how you got interested in this particular angle? Yeah, I, I also think Ruth is kind of overlooked um, when, in, in reality, she is one of the most important witnesses and players in the assassination story. Um, yeah, it's it's a little hard to describe, but but not that many people knew the Oswalds at that time, or were were that close to them. But Ruth and Michael Payne, uh, you know, spent more time with them than than you know almost anybody in in those at least those couple months, few months before the assassination. So Ruth Payne invited Marina to come live with her. Um, so. Marina stayed with Ruth for two months leading up to the assassination. Um, and Lee would spend the weekend there. And he also spent the night before the assassination there. And uh, most of the Oswald's belongings were stored in Ruth's garage. And that's where the alleged murder rifle was stored. Um, and the, the story is that Oswald picked that up from Ruth's garage uh, that that morning, took it to work. Uh, of course, there's controversy over that, just like everything else. Um, but uh, yeah, Ruth pops up in strange ways. She's also involved with finding, discovering some of the most important evidence against Oswald, um, including this uh, incriminating note that it uh, was used to tie him to this attempted shooting of uh, General Edwin Walker, a, a right wing general who was uh, sort of, uh, you know, fired by by the Kennedys. Um, and she also took this letter that Oswald was writing to the Stovey embassy and uh that's been used uh as you know possibly to show that he had some connections to to the communists uh also extremely controversial um and of course ruth was uh an instrumental part in oswald getting a job at the the book depository she the the story is she heard from a neighbor about this job she made the call to the book depository, asked them if they had some any work available, and referred Lee there. Um, and and that's not all. There, are, you know, several other other areas where where Ruth and Michael Payne tie in to the story. Now, were the Oswalds introduced to Ruth Payne and Michael Payne through George de Mortenschild? Is that accurate, or is that is there some controversy or question to that? area yeah Did you look I, into that at all or what, what what do you think about that I, I don't know if you would say they were directly introduced by George de Morenstilt but uh George de Morenstilt brought Oz the Oswalds to this party uh you know where there were some of these oil people white Russian you know oil people and um and Ruth and, and Michael Payne were also invited to this party and they they linked up at that party. Um, and Ruth did speak to George de Morenschild at that party. And uh, I believe they, they also met one time after that, um, I think in the, in the aftermath of the assassination. Yeah. There's a lot of coincidences and, and uh, prior meetings with players in the assassination um, like Ruth Payne and George de Schilt. I mean, de Schilt, I believe there's a photo of him with a young Jackie Kennedy because 
his brother dated uh, someone related to Jackie. Well, at the time, Jackie uh, Bouvier. Is that true? Uh, I know that George DeMorne Schultz was on friendly terms with, with Jackie's family. That Yeah, like she sat on his knee when she was a kid or something, you know, they, they, that, that there was some connection between, between those families. And then of course there's DeMorne Schultz connection to uh, George Bush senior uh, through uh, his, I, I forget it's, it's some through some private school connection of his nephew or something, but they had actually met uh, and DeMar and Schultz wrote, ended up writing a letter to George Bush asking for help because he was being harassed by unknown persons after the assassination. Yeah, I think that letter was in the 70s when, when he was, maybe it was earlier, but he was supposed to be called to testify to the House Select Committee in the 70s. And before he could testify, he was either murdered or he shot himself at his house. And that's a whole other thread in this whole thing. And basically, DeMore and Schilt is a intelligence connected um, energy fellow who, who, you know, from the energy sector who goes to other countries to convince dictators or would be pro Western leaders to align with our energy interests. And, uh, you know, money changes hands. And, but he's also got these murky intelligence connections. And I just always found it odd that a guy like him would be hanging out with Lee Harvey Oswald, who really had no money. Um, didn't you know what I mean? Like they, they always the people who support the official account always want to paint Oswald as this, you know, loser, low life with with no friends who was, you know, angry at his situation. And that's why he did it, because they could never really come up with a great explanation or uh, motive for why he did it. But when you see him <laughs> kind of palling around with someone like George the Mornschild, it really kind of it raises a lot of eyebrows. And, you know, furthermore, with Ruth and Michael Payne, if they were, if they were just, you know, who everyone thinks, you know, what the official story says about what, who they are, um, why would they have those connections, and why would they have like spying equipment, like the the cameras, the Minox spy cameras? Um, you talked about the garage and a lot of the evidence. They did find one or two Minox spy cameras in the garage, right? Yeah, the the Minox spy camera is a. A, a whole, you know, miniature rabbit hole you can go down. The story is very convoluted, and that's why I didn't cover it in the movie. It, it seemed like it would take too much time to explain. Uh, I just mentioned that there there is a Minox camera that was found, um, but um, yeah, it's at first, you know, it was said to be Oswald's, and there, it was listed on an inventory of items that were taken from the pain home. And then when the FBI got, got the evidence, they said there was no camera. And then it ended up somehow Michael Payne and Ruth Payne, they, they produced a, Min a Minox camera and claimed it was Michael's. Um, and then there are even photos that were developed from a Minox camera <laughs> and there's controversy over what those photos show. If there's actually a photo of Oswald on there, if it's, you know, if it's in Korea where Michael Payne, you know, served in the military or if it's in Japan where Oswald was. Um, but either way, any way you slice it, uh, the fact that either Michael Payne or Oswald had this little spy camera is somewhat suspicious. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it, that's an intriguing thing. People can read about it. There's whole articles about the Minox camera if you look it up online. It, it is very interesting, and it's another underreported kind of nugget in this whole deal. Um, also, though, the original, I think it was the original Dallas police report, or maybe it was a local FBI who said that they found these, and you touch on this in the film, um, drawers that had note cards that had names of suspected, you know, pro Castro or, or communist sympathizers. What, what, what's, what's your take on that? And do you ultimately think that those cards were there or do you think that there's much ado about nothing with that? Cause you present a guy in the film who I don't want to, sorry if I'm giving too much away, if you'd rather not have me go into 
the specifics because we want people to see the film, but this, you know yeah. what I mean? Can yeah. you just, can you, can you speak to the, uh, to the file cabinet in the cards that were supposedly yeah. found? Yeah. So there is a police report where, where they say that several metal file cabinets boxes uh, were taken in into evidence uh, and, that contained names and information about Cuban sympathizers. Uh, so a lot of people, their, their overarching theory about the pains is that they were doing surveillance on the radical left and that possibly they were told to look after Oswald because he had come back from the Soviet Union. And so he was a possible security threat or something, or, or maybe even they were working with Oswald and they were both some sort of spies. So those are, those are some of the theories that people have. Um, and these, this report about these filing cabinets kind of, you know, is, is a piece that you could use to, to argue. Yeah. If, if, if there were files on, you know, radical leftists in, in you know, filing boxes in, in the Payne's garage, and if they were theirs, which is what I understand these, these, yeah, these were, were Ruth Payne's file boxes, not Oswald's, uh, that would, you know, be evidence <laughs> that maybe they were up to something like that. And there are other, other reasons people have suspected that that's that we cover some of that in the movie. And I think also Michael Payne, uh, you know, went to certain student groups or university meetings with Oswald that, that discussed the Cuban issue. They actually went to some of those political discussions that were around yeah. Dallas or Fort Worth area. Yeah. So Michael Payne, there are F FBI reports about him because he would go to this cafeteria near one of the local colleges and sort of provoke political conversations with with young people and start talking about marxism communism cuba you know and uh some people think that michael payne was was trying to root out some possible you know radicals in the dallas area and maybe that's you know, those, those, that's where those files came from. If he was getting information about people there, who knows, but he, Michael Payne and Oswald actually went to right wing and left wing meetings together. They went to like John Birch society meetings and ACL, ACLU meetings. And, uh, there's questions about why, why they were doing that. Michael Payne even says in, in an interview he gave, uh, you know, in the, in the nineties, he said that Oswald told him that he was spying on these groups. So, uh, you know, people can make, make of that what, what they will. Yeah. That, that's a really good possibility. I mean, that kind of dovetails with his activities in New Orleans in the summer of 63, um, when he was on the street handing out those flyers and, you know, one group thought he was pro Castro and then he was, you know, one, Oh no, he's anti-Castro from what I understood. And he was, you know, interviewed on TV. He did that debate with that guy. Um, you know, of course there's John Newman's work, which kind of suggests that maybe Oswald was part of a false defector program from like 1959 onwards uh, when he went over to the Soviet Union. And, you know, the fact that he was able to come back and get a loan from the government to, for the travel is very interesting. And, uh, the official stories like Oswald came back from the Soviet Union with his trophy Russian bride and to, to no fanfare, which is what he kind of expected. He wanted reporters on the tarmac to ask him questions and talk to him. And he was delusional about all that. And I think that tends to just be more window dressing for the official story as trying to paint him as this frustrated loner when he's really kind of connected to more, um, you know, surveillance and military intelligence or, or maybe even, you know, just straight up CIA. Yeah, the the simplistic picture you get, if you know, if you just kind of watch, you know, the mainstream media 
version of the JFK assassination is that he was he was a communist mm. nut, and that's that's it. <laughs> uh, you start looking into it, it's it's a lot more complicated, and there <clears throat> is a lot of evidence to point to the idea that he he could have been a false defector, and you know was uh could have been working with with intelligence well i mean to this day his tax records are still um redact are still you know classified they haven't released those and president biden actually has i think till next month to make a decision to release another round of files so i'm you know we're keeping an eye on that but i wouldn't expect all of them to come out i don't think we'll ever see all of them come out um you know, officially they say, well, there's methods and there might be foreign um, connections who were allies of ours that helped us with intelligence gathering that we don't want to compromise. But I highly doubt anybody uh, alive today is active in any kind of government work that was doing it 60 years ago. You know, <laughs> maybe they're alive, but I don't know. I don't know if I buy that. What, what, what do you make of the all the files that, that have yet to be released? Yeah, well, Ruth and Michael Payne's tax returns are also among those documents, but from really? what I understand, they are exempt from being released under the, the JFK Records Act because of privacy issues. Um, so who knows if we'll ever see those. Um, I, I heard an interesting theory that uh, Gary Aguilar actually shared with me that that they're scared to release a lot of this stuff now because it's the, the research community knows the case way better than even the government people. So they're, they're scared that there's stuff in there that they, they wouldn't even know was incriminating or wouldn't know what it meant. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I don't expect to see any bombshells in the, in the files, but who knows? I, you know, things, interesting things have come out in 2017 uh i found among the new documents that there were ruth payne's brother-in-law john hoke her sister's husband who worked for usaid two applications of his to work for cia and a lot of those pages were unreadable but it, it appeared that he was turned down they said we don't need your services right now but it was you know it's interesting um, well, Ruth Payne's family has a history of intelligence, right? It didn't her, her sister, who she took the road trip to visit, was confirmed CIA, right? That's right. Her her sister was a CIA employee and also worked for the Air Force. Uh, some people think that was a cover, as you know, as a CIA agent, also. Uh, she she was a psychologist from what we understand um and uh her dad worked for usa usaid and was was at least from the one document we have uh we know he was considered for a cia assignment covert assignment in vietnam in 1957 but they did not use him um but i I would say there must be so many other documents that aren't among the JFK records that are still remaining in this batch. You know, there's stuff that never got included uh, that should have been and should, you know, should be declassified with Freedom of Information Act, Act requests. Um, you know, there, there must be so much more stuff on Ruth Payne's family and what they were actually doing. Uh, and many other areas of the case. Uh, so I don't think this, this batch of files is, is the end of the story. Um, but, you know, it, it makes for a good uh, news story and we'll, we'll see what happens that December 15th is the next deadline. But we've seen three, maybe three deadlines go by, I think, since 2017, two or three, they've, they've pushed it back. Trump so. was legally supposed to release all of them in October of 17 because the original act was in 92 and the law said there's uh, 25, you know, 25 years. Only the president can decide to keep things classified. 
And Trump's like, at long last, we're going to see all the files, Max. They're all going to come out. We're going to release it. We're going to see Lee Harvey Oswald with Ted Cruz's dad having a picnic on the grassy knoll. But uh, it's funny because Trump's like this great conspiracy guy, but it's also it's also silly and harebrained and just he clearly hasn't. He clearly hasn't really done any really like careful or <laughs> yeah. consi considered research into it. I mean, um, but I think, you know, Pompeo or uh, I don't know, somebody gave uh, a, a visit to Trump and was like, nope, you're not going to release this, this and this. So, you know, um, my friend Jason Burmis, who is a researcher and who's into this, made the great point to Roger Stone. He said, look, if Trump can't even battle the deep state from 60 years ago, how the hell is he going to battle him now? <laughs> Yeah. You know, yeah, I, I think anybody who has, you know, is looking to to Donald Trump to, uh, you know, uncover <laughs> uncover the deep state and save the country or something is is mistaken. Um, yeah, we'll we'll see. Uh, I heard from one of the lawyers who was working on this. You heard about this Mary Farrell Foundation lawsuit. They. Mm -hmm. They sued the Biden administration and the National Archives for withholding, continuing to withhold these documents against the law. Uh, they got a lot of great media coverage, and that's you know that's wonderful. You don't you don't usually see that, um, but I think they don't expect everything to come out. Uh, we'll probably get another partial batch of documents. Uh, next time, December fifteenth. Yeah, and, and and Trump did release, you know, a, a pretty fair amount to hit to his credit. Um, excuse me. Obviously, not all of it came out, and not everything we wanted or, or hoped for. But there were, like you said, there were some discoveries. Russ Baker from Who, What, Why has made some great inroads on that. Uh, John Newman, um, uh, Jefferson Morley has done some amazing work on this. Uh, I think one of the nuggets that came out was it was confirmed that Mayor Cavill's brother uh, was CIA and he was informing since the 50s. So that, that would have meant at the time he was a CIA informant or at least connected through his brother. Um, but like you said, um, I think they're probably worried, the people in the archives, and they tried to use COVID as, COVID as an excuse, which I thought was was hilarious. I think they're worried that the researchers, they do know this case inside and out, and they know more than a lot of these government eggheads. So, like, I agree with what you said. There isn't going to be a smoking gun that shows some photo or some admission or something like that, but there's going to be a small little piece that comes out, some some document, some throwaway line in a paragraph that a researcher is going to be able to take and put into that puzzle and it will make something else make a lot more sense or really give an explanation for something. Um, so in the process of this film, uh, it looks like you were able to actually spend a lot of time personally with Ruth Payne. How, how much over the years, how much time were you able to actually spend with her in person, like talking to her and asking her questions? Well, I, I probably filmed with her a total of only uh six six or seven days or something and but that was over the course of uh two two three years i think um so yeah i you know i i conversed with her also I, we emailed and but you know I, I wouldn't say i was able to get to know her that well uh she's also she's she's fairly guarded she does these interviews she's very open to talking to people she's done many interviews with you know network news when they do the 10th anniversary special 40th anniversary special ruth payne is one of their go-to people um but she doesn't necessarily let down her guard much and give you anything new or you know show her emotions or anything so uh i you know i spent some good time with her i i, I definitely asked her tougher questions <laughs> than i think she's ever been asked on camera uh but um yeah i i have a lot of respect for her she's a very strong person extremely intelligent uh and i always say whatever you think about her 
no matter how innocent or how guilty you think she is, you have to still have a measure of respect for her as a human being and somebody who's who's lived with this like tremendous burden, this pressure, whether whether you think she's guilty or not, it's still still a burden she's she's carrying. Yeah, no, that's a great observation. And that's another thing I really enjoyed about the film too, Max, was that you didn't lean into it one way or another. You weren't you weren't acting like Peter Jennings, case closed, there's no conspiracy. I'm I'm the I'm the paternal figure. I'm gonna tell you what's what. I, I know what happened. Um, but you were also don't go off the rails with the conspiracy stuff, um, speculating too much or um, you know, really pointing a finger in her face. Um, you know, maybe, maybe she, I, I do think she knows more than she's saying. Um, but maybe she actually felt like she was doing the right thing for the betterment of her country. She was actually, she might believe that she was serving her country in whatever capacity that was as an intelligence asset or whatever. Um, and was not involved in setting Oswald up. You know, I think maybe it's possible that could be the case, but I also think it's possible given the evidence and a lot of the information that there's something more nefarious going on. I mean, I don't, I obviously, I don't know for sure. I mean, that's why I I research it and do podcasts like this and talk to people who've looked into it, you know, even more deeper than myself. So, so you're, you're, what's, what's your overall takeaway having actually been able to meet her and talk to her and kind of look her in the eyes? Do you, do you, do you kind of get that vibe that she, whatever the outcome, she felt like she was doing the right thing or do you think there might be something more nefarious going on? Yeah. Well, if, if you've seen, uh, any of my other interviews, I, I usually dodge this question of, of what my take is on Ruth Payne people. Oh, okay. Almost every time I show the movie, somebody asks, well, well, what do you really think? Is she guilty? Or, you know, (laughs) and, um, I just kind of, you know, say that I'd rather leave it open-ended. And I think that the movie is more powerful without knowing what my final take was because it, it did the whole, the whole point of that, this movie to me is that people think for themselves. Uh, I'm not trying to make a, a propaganda piece that's trying to convince you of something. I, I want you to <laughs> go through a critical thinking process and you know be challenged to to come to your own conclusions. Um, so yeah, I, I I don't really answer that question. Maybe one day I'll hey. I'll, I'll be more open uh, pub- pub- publicly. Um, yeah, but you know, I, yeah, I do tend to think that whatever she did, she, she feels like she's doing the right thing. It, that does seem like that. You know, That's kind of what I gathered. Yeah. yeah. I, that's kind of my, that's my takeaway from, from my experiencing of your film. And I, yeah. I appreciate you saying that, um, we, we don't have to press you on that. Um, uh, another area, though, I wanted to ask about. I think you. I think this is touched on in the film. Is her is the ve- the vehicles. Uh, one of the vehicles, maybe the station wagon. Um, did Michael have a Nash Rambler? Is that was that one of his cars? Or because that that goes into the idea that Oswald left the depository fifteen minutes after the shooting, and was observed by a Dallas police officer by the name of Roger Craig getting into a I think a green station wagon or a Nash Rambler. He was asked about it later and said, oh, that's Ruth Payne's car. I don't want to bring her into this. Are you familiar with that angle? Yeah, I'm familiar with that, you know, that report that Oswald said that. Uh, and if somebody saw this this vehicle and Oswald was reportedly the one who said, oh, that, that was Ruth Payne's car. Don't bring her into this, which is very weird. <laughs> it, like, it, it doesn't compute to me. I, I almost... Uh, don't believe that it's like why why would he even say that um but so i i didn't include that in the movie i i don't quite know where it all ends up uh but i think they they actually owned a um a different kind of station wagon i think it's a, a bel air maybe a chevy bel air but some people say oh it could have been mistaken for a nash rambler <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I think there are a lot of a lot of kind of dead end uh, paths. There are a lot of like little mysterious things that that can hook you 
but where does it is it is it a a fruitful thing to to look into does or is it just just sort of enticing does it does it go anywhere uh i don't know i i don't see see where that one goes it's, it's well, curious um but yeah, well that kind of negates the idea that oswald uh was supposed to get into a taxi and let someone else take his spot and then hopped on a bus and then made his way back over to you know the the boarding the rooming house and then made his way to go shoot tippet so that yeah but yeah i i agree i mean it's it's another one of those threads but it's very interesting i still think it's interesting and i think it's interesting um what happened to that officer who never changed his story i mean it's in the it was in the news that day you know he basically it comes down to do we believe his word over i think it was henry wade or i forget who the main um Dallas police guy was who had Oswald in custody that evening about yeah. that particular story. Yeah, I, I I admit that I don't I don't know that particular piece that well because uh, early on I decided I wasn't going to put it in the movie. And you know, my I'm I'm probably not as schooled on the assassination as many other researchers out there. I mean, I've I've read many books and I I know. You know, I know the general, you know, uh, plot of the, you know, the, the, the plot of the story. But, um, you know, I while I was making this movie, I, I was focused more on like these particular things that were, were going to be in the movie and crafting a movie than I was like really diving deep on on each piece. So um, I admit that there, you know, there are many more people out there who are. Uh, better educated on this stuff than I am. Yeah, I mean, and obviously with, with the limitations of just, you know, one movie, you can't cover everything. There's only so many things you can cover. But a couple other threads in, in your film and your work that you've done that I found to be really, really interesting was the um, the vacation spot, I think, in Massachusetts, which was like an island. And then the CIA, um, it was Dulles who was having an affair with, Michael Payne's relative, or was, I, I'm sorry, I forget the specifics. Can you can you kind of go into that a little bit and what you think about that? So yeah, the, I, I cover this uh, this private island, Nashawn Island, in the movie. It's uh, owned by the Forbes family, and My, so that's Michael's side. Yeah. So okay. Surprisingly, Michael Michael Payne comes from the Forbes family. His mom his mom's name was Ruth Forbes. Uh, also named Ruth, um, her first, first, uh, yeah, her first husband was Michael Payne's father, uh, Lyman Payne. And, um, she remarried later this, uh, this guy who invented the bell helicopter. Um, but anyway, these are, you know, Michael Payne comes from a very, you know, high pedigree Eastern establishment family, uh, his family goes back to somebody who signed the Declaration of Independence, um, and yeah, it's you know that that scene. Uh, it's kind of like this. It's kind of a classic conspiracy trope where you you're like tracing people's family members, what they did, going back generations. But it, it's it's very intriguing, you know, just to get a sense of who these people are. What is what is this world they're coming from? And um, yeah, the fact that Michael's mother knew Alan Dulles through one of her best friends, who was Alan Dulles's mistress, is intriguing. <laughs> I'd say so. <laughs> I think Dulles even joked about it, or someone joked about it at one point. They made a crack about it. Yeah, Dulles said something about the the conspiracy theorists would would have a field day if they knew about this. And the Forbes, I think John Kerry is connected to the Forbes too. I'm pretty sure that's his middle name, John Forbes Kerry. So, yeah, he's kind of go. But he's got a house on that island too, from what I understand. He, does he, he really? Vacations, he vacations there also. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I don't know. I think I think these are all pieces of the puzzle, though, Max. You know, whether it's like you said, what do you do with them? What you know, where do they go? But I do think they're important pieces. Yeah, I, I agree. I just think. There's so much out there, you know, <laughs> it's important to, like Joseph McBride said, you know, kind of limit yourself and, 
and don't get overwhelmed in in the mass of details and like um because you can you can lose picks you can lose sight of the big picture and what's important and you can start having these arguments about obscure stuff that probably doesn't even matter <laughs> just a lot of minutia there is a lot of minutia yes there is and uh you know i i don't want to waste my life talking about too much minutia i mean i i love minutia i wouldn't have made this film <laughs> if i if i didn't but uh I, I think sometimes it can be a dead end. Yeah, and and um, like Jesse Ventura, you were actually able to get in touch with Marina Oswald, but that that didn't. Uh, she did not agree to be to be interviewed, right? Yeah, and I didn't know about the the Jesse Ventura interview until after my film came out. Um, but I think he just got her on audio or something a little bit, or right? Well. Yeah, so his cameras were there, and I think they if they filmed her, they kind of blurred her out, or they, they were filming, and they put the camera down, and they really just kind of got the audio, and he's like, he's like, Marina, I'm a Navy SEAL. I'm not afraid of anything. You know, he kind of, they had to kind of make it a little dramatic, but, yeah, you know, and, and it's funny, too, because Ventura is actually, there's a quote, or there's a little feature of him in the um, Sixth Floor Museum. I was there three years ago. They got a little, they got a little thing, a little nod to Ventura, which I thought was pretty cool. I'm That's sure funny. you've been up there. I don't know if you if you caught that. I didn't. I I haven't been up there since 2014 or something. Okay. Um, He's like, but, let, let it let it be known, Max, that the former governor of Minnesota don't buy the Warren Commission. That's his little. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I I talked to Marina on the phone, and I was really surprised that she she answered. I got her phone number and. She answered the phone. She she spoke to me. She was very friendly, uh, but she wasn't interested in doing an interview. And she didn't she didn't say too much when I asked her about Ruth about Ruth Payne. She she was pretty measured in you know what she said. Um, but uh, yeah, and she's yeah. I, I'll people can watch the movie to 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 hear what with the rest of what she told me. There is a little bit of Marina Oswald in there, folks, and, and I, I really I can't tell people enough. Uh, check this movie out. Um, what's the What's the website for the film, Max? The website is jfkpain.com, and pain is spelled P-A-I-N-E, and that's okay. that's my handle on Twitter and Facebook, also. Uh, yeah. So, do you know if uh, if, if Ruth has seen the film? Yeah, I got a report, uh, or I saw some, online somebody who watched the film with her, her friend, uh, reported back that Ruth's reaction was, quote, well done, but powerfully awful. That's, that's what Ruth said about my film. And I took that as a, as a compliment. I mean uh to be you know to be well done is good and if it's awful and at least it's powerfully awful you know if so, it's going to be awful yeah, yeah. It's, that wow she could have another career as a film critic yeah and then just a few days ago there was an article in the the Dallas Morning News if people look up Ruth Payne on Google News right now you'll see that uh where somebody else interviewed her and there was it's a pretty long article about her and she does weigh in on the movie and you know i think she kind of she said something similar like oh it's it's fairly professionally done but she has some you know some complaints about it and um yeah she she says something like oh there's there's some video on the internet you know <laughs> Oh about, yeah, yeah, right. That's, yeah. that's pretty dismissive. Yeah. Hey, the Sixth Floor Museum, they love her, man. They trot her out. You know, they did an event with her. They did an event with uh Buell Frazier, who uh drove Oswald to the depository that day. And you know, he's still around. I think he's probably in his mid to late seventies at this point. He was pretty I think he was nineteen when uh when in nineteen sixty three. So he'd be he'd be what in his late seventies, pushing eighty. 
Um, but the authority showed up at the, the Payne's house, and she basically said to them, oh, we've been expecting you. I always thought that was kind of interesting, or we, or we know what this is about, or, you know, it's about time you got here or something like that. Did you, did yeah. you get to ask her about that at all? or? Yeah, I did. And that's that's something that got cut out of the film uh, just for for timing reasons, I think. Um, but yeah, from what I understand, two officers who who came to the pain house reported that Ruth said, we've been expecting you uh, when, when they arrived there. Um, and when I asked Ruth about that, she she just dismissed it and said that that's not true, that she didn't say that. Yeah. Hmm. And you mentioned earlier that letter uh, pertaining to Walker. With the Walker thing, it's, it's interesting because uh, Oswald didn't drive. I don't think he had a license. I don't think, I'm pretty sure he didn't drive because if he did go to Mexico City, it was on a bus. And there's a, there's a whole bunch of discrepancies about that. That could be a whole other podcast. But the Walker shooting, like if Oswald was supposedly this amazing crack shot who got the shots off at Dealey Plaza, how the hell did he miss a guy sitting at his desk, you know, <laughs> not moving? And uh, and then, I mean, that that whole scene. But but this letter basically was found or was given to the authorities by Ruth Payne later on because she found it in a magazine or in a book. What was the story on that? Yeah, so there's this this note. It's called the Walker note because it was used as a piece of evidence uh, to show that Oswald went out and took a shot at, at General Walker. Uh, this is in March of 63, I believe. And um, yeah, I mean, this Ruth, this, the story is that the police didn't take all of the Oswald's belongings they, and they left a book of Marina's on the shelf or something. And Ruth saw it and thought, oh, Marina might want this book. I'm going to give it to the Secret Service to pass on to her. It was a book about, I think, childhood, child rearing advice in Russian. Um, and so Ruth, Ruth didn't find the note, but the authorities looked through the book when, after she gave it to them and they found the note that's the story and you know then they came back and asked her what what the hell is this were you trying to send this note to marina um and she said she didn't know anything about it um so there's you know there's controversy over that uh because yeah a lot of people don't believe that oswald took took the shots at walker uh or they think you know maybe it was it was some sort of set up some, uh, you know, faked, faked assassination attempt for some reason. Maybe Walker wanted to set it up for publicity or something. That's one of the theories. Yeah, I have heard that. Yeah, for uh, to get sympathy or, yeah, to garner some kind of publicity. I mean, he, he ended up being pretty... pretty yeah, I think he was aligned with John Birch. He was pretty far right. And I think he was dismissed for trying to rile up troops over on a on a base to basically go against the Kennedy admin. I think that's why he was dismissed. Yeah, and he was he was also involved with, you know, kind of pro pro segregation rallies while they were were trying to desegregate some schools in the south. Um interesting guy, Walker. Um yeah. But it you know ideologically it does not make sense <laughs> for oswald to be a communist and shoot 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 at walker that makes that makes sense if he's a communist but to turn around and then shoot kennedy uh doesn't really uh compute ideologically uh if he's he was trying to kill extreme right wingers walker was one of the people who distributed the you know, wanted for treason posters with JFK's face on them in Dallas. He was, you know, extreme anti-Kennedy, thought Aunt Kennedy was a communist. Uh, so, yeah, it, it doesn't doesn't quite make sense. 
Yeah, there's not a lot of it that makes makes a lot of sense, and it was uh, you know buttoned up pretty nicely when after Ruby shot Oswald, and we could never really uh, never really know. Although you know, if Oswald was the only one who was involved and killed Kennedy, he denied it up and down the entire time um, to the media during the press conference and to the authorities while he was in custody for that weekend. So, you know, if this is somebody who felt like a small person who wanted fame and wanted his name to be out there in the history books, he didn't really do, do a great job of it, you know, <laughs> calling himself a patsy and uh, denying it. So it's, yeah, there's a lot that's very, that doesn't make, still almost 60 years later, that still doesn't make a ton of sense about it. Yeah, I guess that's why we're still talking about it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, tomorrow. So tomorrow you're doing a screening uh, and a QA and a with Max Blumenthal. Tell us a little bit about that, Max. Yeah. So we, um, we've got a nice, a big theater in DC, the, the Alamo draft house theater, there's beer and food available with the show. And um, yeah, I'll be there with Max Blumenthal. We'll do a, a discussion after the film. Um, it's uh this should be our biggest screening yet and i hope we get some some dc insiders maybe a few cia agents you know some people from usaid i don't know uh some congressmen we'll see um but it is it is the 59th anniversary of the assassination and you know this this is story is far from being over you know this is this is unsettled history in our country and it's not, it's not going to go away anytime soon. So we can either, we can either have a, like an honest, you know, reconciliation over what happened and, or this, this is going to be like an open wound forever. Um, and yeah, we have one more year. It'll be the 60th anniversary. That'll be a big, push to get some attention on this issue um i know i, I think you know, people are going to be planning a lot of a lot of events uh over the next year and I, i'm sure i'll be showing the movie again around that time yeah i hope so i mean it's a great film and and uh folks please check it out i was able to uh rent it on um uh i think vimeo i think i was able to get it on vimeo yeah it's, it's available, available on uh Amazon, iTunes, Vimeo, you know, Google Play, YouTube, all that, all that stuff. Um, and if if you really want a DVD, I I did get some DVDs made recently. Uh, I was surprised, but I guess there are still still some people out there who are watching DVDs. Oh yeah, oh, that, that... yeah. One more thing, I have I, I, oh, I do yeah. have a, a Patreon account. If you look up Max Good on Patreon, and I I posted. Lots of deleted scenes and full interviews um, from the film. I've got an interview with with Buell Wesley Frazier up there that I did. It's not. Oh, interview. really? So that's uh, Patreon.com slash. Um, I'll put it up on the. I think, um, it's, I think it's Patreon.com slash Max Good. Yeah, my name M A X G O O D. All right, let me put that up on the screen. Then I got a couple of comments here. We can. Yeah. So patreon.com slash max good to access some, um, some of the cutting room floor stuff and some bonus interviews. Yeah. I mean, if, if you, uh, if you really were intrigued by the film, I suggest signing up for this because there's uh this is like, instead of making the, the big, you know, Blu-ray package, uh, I've done this for now. And uh, there's a lot of stuff up, up on there. Some deleted scenes about that Minox camera, um, you know, other other issues that uh, didn't quite make it into the film. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's so much uh, so much information. Looks like we had a fellow here. Uh, Schwartz Pebble check. No files on Cuba sympathizers. No surveillance by the pains. Total bullshit. Schwartz has kind of been uh, commenting through our interview. Thank you, Schwartz. I appreciate your your commentary. Uh, we take positive and negative commentary. You know, we don't, we don't try to censor anything. What else do we have here? I couldn't tell if that was, that was supportive or not, but I think, you know, the, the those files, you, if you see them in the context of these other 
pieces of evidence that might point to the pains being involved in the in, in intelligence uh you know it 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 there's there might be a pattern there you know it's not just that this this is one isolated point well i mean ruth payne ended up in a latin american country years later what in the late 80s or early 90s and they basically kicked her out and told her to leave they're like don't don't talk to her she's cia i don't i don't remember if you covered that in the film but did you get to ask her about that at all yeah i asked her about the, the her time in nicaragua and when you know, people she was working with down there in the sort of these charity groups that were helping the poor um they suspected that ruth could be some sort of cia asset um who was informing on them because this it was a, a very um charged time down there this is during iran contra era and you know soon after that when the the CIA was very active down there trying to subvert this uh, Sandinista revolution. She happened to be down there. <laughs> she just happened to be down there, you know. <laughs> it's amazing. It's kind of amazing when you think about it, you know, how she crops up. I love the, I love, I think you showed in the film she had a uh, no Iraq war or some anti war sign in her yard. <laughs> And it really reminded me of a lot of, I live in Peterborough, New Hampshire, and a lot of um, Unitarian and, and Quaker and neoliberal types who who, who kind of have that posture. But if she really has those intelligence connections, man, you know, and then the Bell helicopter thing and everything else, it's just, it's, it's almost kind of like a comedy of errors in a lot of ways. It's a tragedy and a comedy, you know? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Ruth's got all that stuff on her window. She's got... I stand with Snowden and, you know, end war and uh, I support the ACLU and stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's there's this, this question of, you know, left, right and who's who's really on what side. Uh, you know, that's that's something that's kind of woven throughout the film is is this, you know, what's what does it really mean to to be left or right and like who who's representing themselves as a leftist or or you know as a right winger there's it's this issue with with oswald also and uh i think that has you know a lot of relevance to to today when uh things are things are being becoming confused <laughs> uh and a lot of people you know maybe should be questioning are they thinking for themselves or are they parroting what what they think they're supposed to be part of you know if i am i am a liberal i am supposed to believe this and say this and align myself with these people um you know i think we should all be thinking for ourselves i agree 100 percent uh I'm, I'm very very discouraged to see so many so-called progressives now that are not they're not really anti-war anymore there's none in congress that i can really think of i mean they're saying Ro Khanna is the most anti-war and he continues to fund everything that's going on with Ukraine and Russia. But that's a whole other thing. But it is related to what we spoke about tonight. And the last uh, the last thing I want to show here, uh, Keisha, Schwartz Pebblecheck. This interview was well done, but powerfully awful. Thank nice. you, Schwartz. May the Schwartz be with you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Um, Please check out Max's film, and if anybody's in the Virginia, D.C. area tomorrow, go to the Alamo Draft House in, uh, is it in D.C. or Arlington, Virginia, you said? or It's in D.C. Yeah. Okay, in D.C., and it starts at 7 or 8 o'clock tomorrow night? Yeah, 7 p.m. tomorrow. Okay, mm -hmm. 7 p.m. tomorrow. All right, everybody, well, thank you very much for tuning in to Jacqueline Radio, and we will talk to you soon. Thanks a lot.